The story of the Queen Mary starts in the Roaring Twenties. This was in the interwar years and was characterized by high economic growth, particularly in the United States. During World War I, fleets of ocean liners had been called up for wartime service. Cunard, one of Britain's leading shipping lines, had seen many of its ships called up, including the Aquitania and the Mauritania, both of which were used as troop carriers as well as hospital ships. However, following the war, Cunard was able to, relatively quickly, rebuild its transatlantic network. Despite suffering heavy losses, including the loss of their transatlantic express line of Lusitania, Cunard were in a better position than many of their rivals. New tonnage in the way of war reparations allowed Cunard to quickly rebuild their transatlantic service. The most notable addition was the Hamburg America liner Imperator, reparations for the loss of Lusitania. Renamed Berengaria after the Queen Consort of Richard I, this ship actually is Cunard's first queen, but I think that's a story for another video. Berengaria was partnered with Aquitania as well as Mauritania, which held the transatlantic speed record. These three ships allowed Cunard to dominate the transatlantic service for much of the 1920s. However, this abruptly changed in 1929 when Germany's Norddeutsche Lloyd put into service two magnificent new ships, the Bremen and the Europa. Bremen and Europa were like nothing the world had seen before. Sleek, modern and fast, the 51,600 gross ton liners instantly captured the attention of travellers on both sides of the Atlantic. Their speed allowed them to capture the transatlantic speed records, with Bremen taking the accolade from Mauritania in 1929. This renewed competition caused concern for Cunard and other British shipping companies including White Star Line. At White Star, plans were created for the construction of an 80,000 ton giant. To be named Oceanic, the ship's design called for a length of 1,000 feet and a top speed of nearly 30 knots, powered by up to 40 diesel generators. Cunard also made plans for an 80,000 ton behemoth. At over 1,000 feet in length and powered by steam turbines, the new Cunard ship was laid down in December of 1930 at the John Brown shipyard in Clydebank, Scotland, as hull number 534. However, the Great Depression was having an impact that was becoming more and more severe. Cunard and its rivals began to suffer financially. With less commerce, there were fewer travellers on transatlantic liners, and the liners that were operational were carrying less mails and cargo, meaning less income for shipping lines. Due to this financial pressure, Cunard had little choice but to cancel construction on Hull 534 in December of 1931. This meant that the John Brown shipyard had to lay off thousands of workers, which further exacerbated the problems associated with the Depression. In France, the French line were working on a new superliner of their own. Named the Normandy, construction on this 79,000 ton liner commenced in January of 1931. Unlike Cunard, the French line had government funding to complete the Normandy, meaning work continued throughout the Depression. In Italy, the Italia line launched the Rex. A fast liner, Rex entered service in 1932 and went on to capture the westbound transatlantic speed record from the Europa, marking the first time the Italians had held the prestigious Blue Riband. Back in France, the Normandy was launched in October of 1932. In fact, she was launched on the 29th of October, three years to the day of the stock market crash. This was a huge victory for the French, and 200,000 spectators came out to see the Normandy launched, and she would go on to capture the westbound and eastbound transatlantic speed record. By now things were looking dire for Cunard. Hull 534 was rusting away in Clydebank. The huge, unfinished hulk was regularly used by newsreels and newspapers as a symbol of the effects of the Great Depression and had become ingrained in the minds of the British public. Cunard was hemorrhaging money. Their older ships were unable to compete with the likes of the Rex, the Bremen and the Europa, and so they approached the British government for financial support. White Star Line was also struggling. They had long since abandoned their plans for Oceanic, and were themselves in need of financial support. The government of the United Kingdom were aware of the value of British shipping, but they weren't keen on supporting two weaker British shipping companies, in fact, their preference was for one larger, unified British shipping company. And so the government agreed to provide the funding to complete Hull 534, as well as funding for a running mate, which would allow them to establish the first ever two-ship weekly transatlantic service, on the proviso that the two companies merge. And so in 1933, Cunard and White Star entered into merger negotiations. These negotiations took quite some time to work out, 
These companies had, after all, been fierce rivals for decades. But in 1934, an agreement was established, creating Cunard White Star Line. As such, funds were made available to recommence work on Hull 534. This led to thousands of people flocking to John Brown in an attempt to gain employment. On the day that the work restarted in the yard, two pipers wearing full regalia met the shipyard workers at the gates of the yard. When the gates opened, the pipers led them in to the shipyard, and it was later said in the press that those two pipers piped Great Britain out of the Great Depression. The sight of work restarting on Hull 534, this lingering symbol of financial hardship, was a great boost to the nation. Not just a financial boost, but a morale boost as well. The image of the rusting, abandoned hulk of the ship had been widely used as a symbol of the Depression, so to see work restarting once again was a great excitement for people across the nation. Additionally, the financial boost from the yard reopening was wide felt, with industry able to recommence in support of the ship's construction. With work having recommenced on the ship, a launch date of 26 September 1934 was agreed upon. Cunard White Star now had to settle on a name for the new ship. Historically, Cunard ships had had names ending in IA, mostly named after ancient Roman provinces. White Star Line, on the other hand, largely had mythical names ending in IC. For the new ship, Queen Victoria was of interest to the line. The IA name ending had a nice tie-in with the Cunard naming convention. And Queen Victoria had been on the throne when Cunard and White Star Line were both established. While the name Queen signified that this ship was different from previous liners and held a special place in the hearts of the public. Sir Percy Bates, the Cunard White Star Chairman, requested an audience with King George V to request permission to name the new ship Queen Victoria. And as the story goes, at that meeting, Sir Percy Bates said to the King, we would like to name our newest ship after Britain's greatest queen. To which the King replied, my wife will be delighted, and the ship became Queen Mary. The Queen was invited to name the RMS Queen Mary at the launching ceremony in September 1934. The launch took place on a rainy day, yet hundreds of thousands of spectators came out to see the ship make its way down the slipway. Her Majesty was something of an avid diary writer. She used to keep detailed journals of her public engagements. Having launched the new Queen Mary, the ship that symbolised Britain's recovery from the Great Depression, the Queen returned home and wrote in her journal, I launched the new Queen Mary today, Pity it rained. The ship was moved to the fitting out basin where her magnificent Art Deco interior was installed. This was a great departure from the historic Edwardian interiors used on previous Cunard ships. Queen Mary boasted an elegant interior with double height rooms such as the first class lounge, complete with Art Deco style fixtures and fittings. The ship had an international shopping promenade, a cinema and an extra tariff restaurant as well as a kids' play area. She truly was a city at sea. The Queen Mary set sail on her maiden voyage on the 27th of May, 1936. Her Majesty Queen Mary toured the new ship before her maiden voyage, and she took in all of the various public rooms and admired the Art Deco interiors. This, of course, was a great departure from what the Queen would have been used to from previous Cunard liners. Having returned home that day after visiting the new Queen Mary, she wrote in her journal, I toured the new Queen Mary today, it was not as bad as I expected. Queen Mary's maiden voyage was a spectacular occasion, but it was delayed by a thick fog bank, meaning the ship did not capture the speed record on this voyage. But she did capture it later in the year. And while the Normandy would later best Queen Mary's crossing time, in 1938, Queen Mary recaptured the record, both westbound and eastbound, and this time she held onto it until 1952. I hope you've enjoyed this video about the construction and launch of the RMS Queen Mary. There's a lot more to the story of the Queen Mary as well as her sister ship, the Queen Elizabeth, so I'll be looking into that more in future videos. If you'd like to learn about Queen Elizabeth's maiden voyage, check out that video in the info card or the description below. Thanks again for watching and until next time, I hope to see you on board.